My name is Amir Kirsch, and I'm going to talk about teaching C++. This is the topic. So um, I would start with presenting myself. Um, I'm a lecturer at the Academic College of Tel Aviv Yafo and Tel Aviv University. I teach C++ for more than 20 years now. I started when I was a student, um, and, and time flies. Uh, and I'm also a dev advocate at Incredibuild. Uh, I think that I spoke with some of you uh, here or in other occasions about Incredibuild. We do uh, build acceleration. Um, if you suffer from long builds, feel free to talk to me about that. I think we can assist you. Uh, I'm also the co-organizer of the Core CPP conference in Tel Aviv. I would have a few words about that at the end. Uh, but the talk is about my experience as a teacher and, and um, teaching mainly C++ uh, over the last... I, I started at the Academic College of Tel Aviv at uh, 1998. Um, so it was well before C++ 11. Um, and, and I think at this point of time I can share some experiences, some advice. And, and the idea is to discuss with you my insights to get new insights from you. Uh, I think C++ now is known for the discussion uh, th that we have during the talks, during the sessions and afterwards. So this is the goal. Discuss difficulties in teaching C++ and discuss some uh, receipts that I would give, but also things that you would raise here. I just talk with, uh, talked with some of you before we began and we have a few other teachers sitting here. Uh, and also some were not teacher by occupation, but they do teach when, you know, you get a junior into your team and, and you want to get him in or her. So everybody teaches at a certain point of time. Uh, we have seven chapters in this talk. So um, we would start with why teach C++, then the difficulties, uh, what should we teach the syllabus, um, what I do in a class lab exercise, maybe you do as well, uh, homework exercise, the exam, and some conclusions. At the end of each chapter, I would stop for questions and a discussion. And again, the idea is to get comments from you, to discuss things, to get new insights, and as well as disagreements. You can disagree with me, and I would be happy to hear other thoughts. So let's start with why teach C++. I mean, this is a, a, an important question, and I would tell you that this question rises up, I would, I would not say every year now, but five, ten years ago, I was sitting in meetings where we discussed the curriculum and, and the thought of maybe we should move from C++ to another language came up occasionally, and other institutions did so. So, um, you know, C++ is not something that is a must. Maybe there are other alternatives. Now, there is a great post by Joel Spolsky, uh, who is known to be the co-founder of Stack Overflow, but is also known to be the author of the blog post, Joel on Software. Uh, so in 2005, he posted the parallels of Java schools. It was more than 15 years ago, and back then already, many institutions in the United States and elsewhere began to move from C and C++ to Java or um, .NET. C Sharp, I think, was then already. And he said that, well, you lose something. I mean, um, when I was uh, young, he said, I was uh, programming with uh, one and zeros, and, 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 I, and, and my teacher said, uh, lucky bastard, I was programming only with zeros. <laughs> and, and, and you know, if you move to something which is easier, maybe you lose something. And this is a great post. And, and in some cases when I speak with students or, or with a faculty, uh, members about why C++, I do mention this blog post. And he says that if you 
learn C++, you would be a better programmer even if you program in other languages because you understand better the underneath, the under the hood things. But I disagree. I, I think that this is not the best reason for teaching C++. The same as teaching assembly is not something that you would invest much time in order to be a good programmer in C++ or in Java. So, I, I mean, yeah, maybe you need to know a certain, what is called system language, it can be C, but it might be that your object-oriented programming language or the language that you would master in would not be C++. And I don't think that making things harder for the student is a goal by itself. I mean, it's good. I, I mean, working hard is good, but you can work hard and do complicated stuff in other languages. So even though it is written very well, and some of the arguments are very convincing, I don't think that this is the reason of, okay, students should have odd life and they should start from the very, you know, things that are close to the metal and be on the hardware. And, but if they are not working on this environment, so it's, not, it, it's, it's like, you know, investing too much time in teaching assembly. Uh, how much time do you, in your faculty, um, teach assembly? Two hours? A course of two, three hours. Um, in, in, in my faculty, it was three hours and was uh, re reduced to two hours. And there is a reason for that because, you know, you have to know the basics, but you're not going to use it to actually write with it, most of you. So I, I'm looking for um, other reasons. And, and again, things are, it, it, it's a decision that you have to make and you have to persuade the faculty because other are moving to a first language like Python and a system language like C or maybe Rust and OP language as Java or C Sharp. And there are other faculties who do not teach C++ as a mandatory course. I'm teaching at, at one of them in Tel Aviv University, C++ is a non-mandatory course. Do you feel C++ is OP language? I would take questions at the end of each chapter. Sorry for that. Uh, we can discuss that. Uh, there was a question, I would repeat it when I would take it. Uh, the, I think the mic went out real quick. The yeah, mic went out. The mic. Might be that we got it before the cut or not. Uh, some institutions go with a first language like Python or JavaScript. Uh, there are those. Uh, and a system language as C or Rust or others maybe. Uh, and an OP language such as Java or C Sharp. Um, and in some institutions, C++ is even not a mandatory course. I even teach in one of those, which is Tel Aviv University, in which C++ was a mandatory course and uh, became a non-mandatory course. And I will discuss that later on. Uh, so why C++ should be a mandatory course? My position on that, and again, I disagree with the argument saying, oh, you have to get students' life harder. They have to uh, um, you know, do the hard stuff. Let's start with pointers. And I believe we should do that, but the argument is not in order to, you know, if you get things harder at the beginning, you would become a better programmer. I don't believe in that. I mean, if you do not need that, don't teach it. I, I mean, you know, in, in some schools in the past, I don't know if, if you got that, people learned Latin. Because if you learn Latin, you would better go to other languages like Italian, Spanish. And, and I think there are um, research there is research on that saying that, you know, transfer of learning, this is the term, doesn't work. I mean, if you want to learn French, go and learn French. Don't learn Latin and then French. I mean, there isn't any actual value in learning something which does not give you value. I mean, this is a tautology, but you get the point. So, why should I, uh, we uh, teach C++? Because it's being widely used in the industry. I think this is the argument. Uh, and it would give you an advantage in the job market. And students can understand this argument. Uh, and and it, it, is, it, it is even um, stronger when other institutions stop teaching C++, because then your advantage is becoming even stronger. You did learn C++. And it is harder to 
complete on your own. So if I taught you Java and eventually you want to work in C++, it would be harder for you. And yes, maybe there are other arguments like, yeah, you would understand the other, under the hood, etc. but this is not the first argument that I would use. And I'm using these arguments uh, when, you know, there is a meeting in the faculty discussing again whether we should keep C++ or when I speak with students because I do raise this argument on the first lesson. And the reason is to build their motivation. Yes. Thank you, Marshall. Uh, so, yeah, I want to build their motivation because they did hear something about, oh, there is this uh, complicated C++ course. So at the beginning, I have to say, it's important. Some of you would actually work in C++. And you would get advantage over others from other institutions who did not do C++. Uh, so I think this is the end of chapter one, why teach C++. And this is a good point for a short discussion on anything that you want to raise, comment, discuss, other than uh, C++ challenges that we would discuss later or things that we would discuss later. Yeah. So interestingly, I think uh, Arizona State University, uh, they require C++ for electrical engineers uh, and engineering students, but they do not require it for CS students. Um, so it's a, one of those strange things where the CS department has decided other things and the engineers still need C++. OK, so th there is a comment here saying, Joel, right? Uh, Jeff, uh, uh, saying that uh, in some institutions, like for example, Arizona State University, yeah. uh, electrical engineering are required to do C++ as a mandatory course, while CS uh, stopped requiring that. Uh, and it is interesting. I, I mean, there are many institutions which stopped requiring C++ as a mandatory course. And then the question is, if it is non-mandatory or not proposed at all. And if it is non-mandatory, what is the percentage of students taking that. Like for example, in Tel Aviv University, it used to be mandatory. And when it became non-mandatory, I think the numbers went down to about 25% of the students taking C++. And by the way, I just checked it when I gave it another talk at ACCU um, about a month ago. And the percentage of women taking C++ went down drastically. I mean, it was before as their percentage in the student's population because it was mandatory, which was about 30, 35, 40%, and it went down to 16%. I mean, it, it seems that women doesn't like C++ for any reason, I don't know why, and listen, you should like it. I mean, it's a great language for any gender. So, um, but this is what I see. I mean, these are the numbers. And, and at the end, we want everybody to take C++ if we want them to be in the industry for C++. We, we don't want to lose anyone. Yeah, yeah. Hans, I, I thanks. I don't really agree with your argument for teaching C++. My argument meant would be that it contains the, all the fundamental things. You can teach value semantics, you can teach uh, references, pointers, you can teach uh, classes, and there is no other language which has everything. Okay, so there is a, uh, an argument here saying that if you teach C++, there are many characteristics in C++ that are used in other languages, but there is no language that has it all. Yeah. So it's a, a good beginning for seeing many other things. And again, my argument here is that if you are not going to use it, I mean, okay, you have reference semantics, yeah. but if you're going to an, a language without reference semantics or without value semantics, or it works otherwise in another language, so you know, it's just complexities. Why, you know, why complicate things? Why make the students? Yeah, but if I, for example, if I tell the students it's good for the job market, I also in the second year teach formal language theory, and what am I going to tell oh, them? Oh, that's, that's a problem. Then wh when you teach them uh, formal languages or, or algebra or things like that, what would you say? You would have to come out with uh, another excuse. So uh, <laughs> it's not the same excuse for any course, but, but there are good excuses for any course. And, and if you do not have a good excuse, then maybe you have to check yeah, if, if the course is actually needed. I, I mean, it's a good question. Yeah. When I studied computer science at University of Michigan, there were a set of required courses to teach the fundamentals of data structures and algorithms. And those courses were mandatory, and they happened to use C++. But uh, it seemed like the experience of students 
in those courses, the language was more of a barrier to the subjects the introductory courses were trying to teach rather than actually assisting them. Would those courses be considered a mandatory C++ course uh, per your definition here, or is it sort of like a happenstance? So the comment was that in some institutions there are other course courses like data structures that are using C++, but without actually teaching C++ as a language, and the students are required either to you know, get it by their own, or they have a single lesson teaching all they have to know about C++ in order to use that. And I would tell you that when I see things like that, at the end, they are not using the language correctly. I, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a mix and match. They just take things, and, and maybe the data structure course is going well, but it's not actually knowing C++. And if you, if you go to the job market with that, it's not right. So I, I prefer them to use the language that they know, be it Java or Python, and do data structures with the language that they know. In, in the Academic College of Tel Aviv Yafo, they do data structures after C++ or uh, in parallel. So when they do data structures and write, implement in C++, they actually know what they are doing. At least this is what I hope. I mean, they are coming to me with questions on their data structures course because they want some assistance on the C++ part. Yeah? Not specifically C++, but all subjects that people are not going to use in their professional career, they're building blocks that they add on. If it was only we would ever require them to take the classes they were going to use in a professional career, we would only teach senior level classes. Would, how are they going to be qualified to take those senior level classes if they don't have the building blocks? So, so there is a, a comment here saying that it is all at the beginning building blocks. You, you cannot teach them uh, what they need to know uh, for the job market without starting f with some building blocks. And it might be that they would not use the building blocks. So again, I say first, any course needs its own motivation, its own excuse. This, the previous slide, is my excuse for teaching C++. And I think it is a good excuse. I, I'm not saying that there are other, yeah, there are other excuses for C++ or for other classes. And yeah, building blocks is, is a good excuse for other uh, um, languages or topics or classes. Yeah. I just, just a comment that um, if only we had perfect knowledge of the future, we could teach students exactly what they're going to need in their, in their careers. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, 10 years ago, we should have been teaching everybody Swift, right? So they could program on iPhones. Because there's a lot of Swift programmers out there. But Swift didn't exist 10 years ago. Or maybe 12 years ago. Yeah. I'll let you echo Marshall. Yeah, yeah so, so the comment here is that uh, we lack the future knowledge of what we actually need to teach because we do not know what would happen in uh, 10 years from now. So we try to, you know, give our best guess. And our best guess is, you know, doing what we actually do and maybe move slowly to new technologies, new things that we see around, like, for example, um, machine learning. Yeah, it's important. Machine learning using Python and things like that. Yeah. Okay, also, so go one, go blue. Um, I'm also a University of Michigan alumni. Um, and I actually really enjoyed that they taught C++ and data structures in parallel. There wasn't an assumption of knowledge. The assumption was that we will teach you pointer semantics as we are teaching you how data structures work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this was beneficial for a lot of reasons, and I know that you mentioned like it would be better if we taught data structures in a language that you knew, but I think that you're, we're underestimating how many people come into college with no programming background. So like when I took data structures and algorithms, there was no language I knew, right? And so C++ became the language that I knew. And this was really useful in obviously like the, like the, the arc of my career, but also because C++ isn't a language that many people are exposed to like on their own. And so like the representation, like the diversity in this like the alumni of like the University of Michigan, right? Like we all know C++, right? And that, that's really great for representation because we taught everybody, not just the people that happened to be interested in it from like, you know, tangential interactions with people that were already in the in-group of, you know, C++ knowledge. 
So I, I really enjoyed that aspect of, of Michigan's curriculum. I really enjoyed that aspect of, of Michigan's curriculum. Um, and I, I thought it was a great way to get more underrepresented groups involved in the Super Bowl community. So I would summarize uh, uh, the comment here from another Michigan representative, uh, Go Blue, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so um, C++ was in parallel, if I get it correctly, with uh, data structures. Uh, you cannot assume people know any, any language when they begin, I agree. Um, and if it is mandatory, then you eliminate any uh, gender bias or other biases because everybody has to take it if they are enrolled for CS. Um, I agree with most of that. I also come from an engineering university, and if you go back, I think one slide, the, uh, the languages slide, yeah, this one. So we have a, a similar experience about, like, there is one course when we did something like this, or the university did something like this, and uh, the experience was that if you first teach a really high-level language like Python, they familiarize with the concept that memory does not exist. They can just extend arrays and it just works. And if you go to C or any low level language like C++ C++ or Rust afterwards, then they have to unlearn a lot of things. So, so starting with C++ or C eliminates this stuff. And if, you are going, if they are going to work in Python or Java, eventually they will need the complicated stuff anyway, and then they will have to unlearn. So there is a comment here about the order of things, uh, saying that if you start from Python, uh, students get addicted uh, in a way to you do not have to manage your memory. And then when they come to C or C++ or Rust, they say, so why should I do that? And it is harder for them to grasp there and for you as a teacher to you know, get them doing it right maybe. And then the comment here is you should start for, with you know, the more lower level languages like C and C++. I tend to agree, but I do see, like for example, in Tel Aviv University, where they start with Python, that they do get the, um, you know, the relevant parts of C and C++ when they get to it, and they do get the idea and, and the reasons for why we do have to manage memory, because we are not in Python, because Python, at the end, is written in C. So somebody has to write the complicated stuff that would run the other things, and they are smart enough to understand that. So I, I do agree with some of that, but I think that, yeah, you can do the other uh, way around. You can flip the order and start with Python, and it does work in other institutions. Yes, I, I would take that as a, a last comment on this chapter, and then maybe you can use the same comments that you wanted to give and you know, uh, make it fit to the next chapters somehow. Yes. Okay. Uh, for knowledge, actually, there is a good argument teaching it as knowledge because it's a very universal instrument. It's programming structures, memory management, beating your head against the wall and you don't this, you don't know, and so forth. So, so the comment is, are you teaching knowledge or traits? And, and I would tell you that uh, what I actually do or what we as teachers do is one thing, and what we tell the students to motivate them might be a bit different. So if I tell them, okay, you, would, you may need that, you may work in C++, and I believe, uh, and I know some of them would work in C++, I mean, I meet them in the industry. Uh, I meet them around, uh, and they, some of them do C++. So I think that this is a good argument, even though eventually, yeah, I teach them knowledge. So it's both traits and knowledge, but I prefer to justify C++. Again, this is the way I do it for the students and for the faculty, as it's an important language still today, because five or 10 years ago, it was perceived as something, I don't know if I can tell, being dead or on the way off. And it is not true. It was not read back then. 
and now I think everybody understands, and, and, and I, I feel that I have much less to justify. I mean, people do know. So um, let's go to the second chapter, discussing the difficulties in teaching C++. I prefer to change the word to the challenges in teaching C++, sounds better. Uh, so uh, there are many challenges, and this is what I want to discuss now. What is the first answer to a student who asks you something like, um, can I do this with that? Like, so, for example, can I access an item in a vector with square brackets? What would be your first answer? Yes. yes. That's, you know, a decent answer. answer saying yes. I prefer another answer. Why do you want to do this? No, I prefer another answer. Yes, My answer would be just try it. Mm. In many cases, just try it. So when I teach something, uh, a trait, but also knowledge, is, you know, you have the tools. Eventually, I would not be here. You would be on your own. So you, you have, you know, to, to get some independence, you, you have to try things. You have to read on the web. The problem is that in C++, that's not the best answer. Because just try it, just try it is is not always good. I mean, you can try it, it works. Uh, I won't open Compiler Explorer, but even if you do undefined behavior sanitizer, this one goes well with the sanitizer somehow. So there is undefined behavior in this program, which is not code, and, and, and just try it is not the best answer in C++. So should we say just try it? I mean, should I send students for trying things, can they learn from trying things or they would learn bad stuff? This is a question uh, because you know in C++ 7.1% of answers for a question is, well, this is undefined behavior. Don't get this number too seriously, I just made it up. Uh, anyhow, uh, just right. Should we say it? Well, I do say just right. I do say it. Uh, but I say if it fails, analyze why. You know, this is the first part. Maybe it fails. Then you would see that, yeah, it doesn't work. And I can check why. And if it works, so I, I don't say at the beginning undefined behavior because, you know, I have to, you know, I, the, I want them in class. So uh, uh, I say maybe if it works, you may assume it's okay unless it's not. I mean, it's decent enough. So uh, as a teacher, I never guarantee anything for a student unless I saw the entire code. I mean, if they ask me, can I do this and that? I say, I have to see the code. Because otherwise, they would say, but the teacher said, well, you know, you just asked me, you know, out of the blue without seeing your code. It depends. And I, I hate answering, it depends. I mean, it depends is a good answer in C++ now. It's not a good answer in class. So usually I say, yeah, it sounds OK, but I have to see the code in order to give you the, you know, the final answer for that. So we are still in chapter two, other challenges. Uh, things change. Things change. I think this, this is the um, great, uh, the, the, the most significant challenge for us teachers. Maybe not for the students. Maybe also for the students, because when they look, for example, on the web, they may find something which is old. They may find something which is obsolete. Uh, but for us teachers, it's even more challenging. Uh, new ways of doing things. So we have to update our materials. Old correct answers become obsolete or just wrong. Um, even in C++ now, you get occasionally good answers like it depends. Or well, I'm not sure. Or I don't know even, which are good answers. But you, can, you cannot use it too much in class. So what can we do as teachers? Now, I will tell you my personal experience. When I started, I knew little. Uh, we were in C++ 98. Um, I had self-confidence, and I could answer questions. And as years passed by, my self-confidence went down as more I knew C++, because I realized how much I don't know. And when C++ 11 came in, I mean, it took me a while to update my materials. And at the beginning, I was very insecure. 
I mean, there is a question in class, and maybe, I don't know, but, but you know, uh, it cannot be the answer for anything. So in a way, it went down. And I think the way to raise it up is to realize that, yes, it's okay if you do not have all answers. But still, you have to teach what you want to teach. So you lead the students. And it might be that there are you know, areas that you would not um, come to. So um, examples of things that changed, like, for example, um, copy elision, C++14, C++17. I have an example in, in my material, but it behaves differently in C14 and 17, so I either have to change it or to add a comment. It uh, adds time in class to explain more things. Um, rules of implicit move changed over the years. There is a good talk by Arthur O'Dwyer from previous C++ Now. You have to uh, get that if you didn't on implicit move rules and things change there. Aggregate type. What is an aggregate type? I think it changed four or five times over the years. Now, I just don't talk about that in class. I mean, I don't have to feel insecure. Uh, I just, you know, I, I don't, uh, maybe I do say something about aggregate type when I teach std array. But I don't go into these rules. I mean, I say, yeah, there are some rules. Maybe I say one or, or two of the rules, but I don't go through the entire thing, and it's okay. So things change, but my advice is don't get into each and every bit. Keep things simple. Remember the teaching and cheating. Share the same letters. <laughs> Cheat a little, occasionally. And saying only part of the truth is even not exactly cheating. And I, I was not doing that at the beginning. I mean, when I add the information, I felt obliged to share it with the students or to answer questions, and then the lesson ended without the material that I prepared because of a question. Uh, so it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, it's okay if I say, yeah, there are some complications about that. Talk to me in the break. And they never come in the break to talk about it, so <laughs> it's fine. Uh, they come occasionally, but... So uh, you don't have to be exact in each and every answer. It might be that you are not up to date with a specific detail, and that's fine. If you're not sure, throw a little disclaimer, like for any practical aspect, this should be the answer. Yeah, that's good. It's, it, it is better than it depends. Uh, there is something more to it, but we will not dive to it, into it. That's good. It sounds like, yeah, you have some more knowledge, even if you do not. Um, <laughs> on the other end, on the other end, you cannot stay too much behind. So teaching C++ 98 is not acceptable. And I will tell you that in some cases, I hear from students, oh, in our institution, the professor is still teaching C++ 98. And I would tell that, well, it, it, it is not C++ anymore. It's something else. Uh, they would meet code that they cannot read. And, and I will come to uh, comments uh, in a moment. Uh, a few more uh, uh, challenges. Language rules are difficult. My advice, student, most of us actually, not only students, learn much better from examples. So I do not teach rules. I go through examples. And they get the rules through the examples. Um, and, and much attention is given in class to examples. Uh, I try to personalize things. So uh, when I tell, OK, foo is being called here with a char star, the function wants to get a std string. The compiler is tempted to give you compilation error, but then he recalls that in his six years in compiler schools, in his compiler school, he learned that if you can do uh, casting, you should first go through casting. And then I explain what goes here with some story. And you know, students remember stories. So there is a story behind. And the compiler and the linker are friends. They talk with symbols. And you know, things are live. This is how I teach it. A few more challenges. The logic behind C++ rules might be arbitrary. Yeah. So C++ 98 didn't allow direct member initialization. And many books said that the reason is that the member doesn't have yet any place in memory. Well, it's a bad explanation because here now we can do that. And nothing changed about the instance doesn't have any place in memory yet. At the end, the compiler is smart enough to do something with that. 
So I didn't use this argument. I have a better argument. And the uh, better argument is, well, the spec says so. And, and this is a good answer because when I say, well, the spec says so, you know, it, it shortened any long discussion. I, I mean, well, I have my reason. You may think about another reason. We can open the ISO discussion. Some of them are documented. Maybe you can do a dissertation on uh, language history evolution. But at the end, what actually matters is that the spec says so. And, and they do get this argument. And then we go on. Other challenges? Too many questions in class. Uh, it's in any subject. But it is much more in C++. At least this is what I feel. I teach other classes. And, and in, in C++, I, get, I used to get too many questions. Uh, uh, today, in a way, I manage it. And I will tell you how. So many details, and I pace generates many these questions. And these questions divert you from the planned material. And it, it, you know, it's reasonable that they have many questions because there are many rules. And, and this doesn't behave as the previous example. So some of the, uh, of the questions are reasonable. You have to deal with them. So my advice, start with direct questions on presented pieces of code on actual, I don't understand this line. So I'm first taking questions with, do you have a line in the program that I just presented that you want to ask about. Otherwise, wait for your turn. First, those who have questions on exact code line. So we first you know, go through understanding questions, which is good. And then we go to the, to the extrapolation, like what if, like why in the previous example. OK, but then the entire class is aligned which is important. And, and, and by the way, why the entire class, uh, at the same time the entire class is aligned, some of the other just forget their questions. And in some cases I say, OK, we would need to take this question offline. And this is another way of you know, managing the questions because you cannot take them all. Summarizing, um, be careful with, with too many details. And, and at the beginning, when C11 came out, I felt that I have to give all these small details. Today, I try to manage it more wisely. I mean, I don't have to go into each and every bit. Stick to good code examples, make everyone aligned, use more than C++, and keep updating your materials. Uh, this is the time for discuss discussing challenges. If you think you have other challenges, if you want to comment on challenges that I presented, Marshall, you wanted to say something. Uh, it's, it's moot now. Don't worry about it. OK, it means that I answered your question. This is what I do in class. <laughs> OK, uh, I, I postpone questions. And then I, either I don't think that Marshall forgot his question in this case, but it, in some cases, the question was answered on the next slide. Yes. Exactly. So there is a comment here saying that when the answer is it depends, and in many cases the answer is it depends, go with, in most cases, it would work like that. And there are other cases that we can analyze or talk about later, or you would have to show me your code. And this is exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, a major challenge for both students and teachers I've observed is that the great freedom of tools and language standards, if they are even aware standards, exist, versions exist, uh, students are free to use like their own IDEs, their own compilers, their own text editors, and this leads to a lot of challenges on the teacher's part to make sure people are, the students are all on the same page or are even using the same language that is being taught. How much of that is the responsibility of the teacher? Is that a good thing? Okay, so the question was uh, students using different IDEs, different environments, maybe even different operating system, uh, different versions of C++. I dictate that. So I say, what is the language version that we are going to use? What is the IDE that you are going to use? You are going to submit exercises. They have to be compiled with this tool. 
and uh, exercise checker would check it on this operating system. So it is dictated, so we eliminate this issue. I'm not saying that this is the best, but it works well for the course. If you're dictating it, do you also handle setting it up, setting that environment up for the students? Uh, no, because they come uh, after C. So they used uh, the same idea that I'm using, so uh, they are already prepared for that. In both institutions that I teach, they already have that. Uh, some of them are coming with, uh, well, I prefer to use this ID. And my answer is, if it suits you well, but you know, I will not answer questions about something that doesn't work for me. And when you have to submit your exercise, it should be compiled with this ID because the exercise checker would check it on this environment. Okay, so you, you know, it's your responsibility and then most of them just align. Any other comment? Any other challenge? Yeah, for me the challenge when a student asks a question, so we, we, I think we say the past is quite well that we teach it. So when a student asks a question, nearly always there is a wrong way of thinking behind it. So oh, you have to go for the root of his question. That's, that's an important note. There is a note here that when you get a question, in many cases the question starts the root cause of the question is not understanding something. Maybe the X, Y problem, you ask about X, but you actually wanted Y. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah you, you have to understand the question. I, I agree, but um, when you try to get direct questions about I didn't understand this line of code, in, in many cases, it you know, pinpoint the, the, the problem. So it, it may be, and I, I, in some cases, there is a discussion about the question. Or I'm telling the student, okay, I think that I understood your question. I would answer that. But if my answer does not fit your question, you would have to ask again. And I, I do not let the student interfere while I'm answering because maybe I'm not answering his question, but another person had the question that I'm answering currently. So I don't want the, the student uh, telling me while I'm answering, oh, this was not my qu uh, question. No, no, I think that I had a question. This is the answer. Maybe somebody else would you know, be contributed with this answer. And then you can ask again. Yeah. So this is really a uh, really good point. And this relates to your first question. Can you use square brackets on a vector? My answer is, well, it is like an array. So square, square brackets work like an array. And the question actually usually meant that they don't know that what vector is. So uh, uh, the, uh, qu the comment uh, went back to uh, what I just raised before. Uh, a student asked, can I use square brackets on a vector? And maybe the problem is that they do not want, uh, know what a vector is. And then, yeah, there would be a discussion on that. I mean, I would not just answer each question with just try it. But I go with, okay, this is the answer, but usually you can just try it. Yeah, so it, it is combined. Yeah, it is combined. The time, I already gave the answer. Why do you want to do that? Um, yeah, but I think that uh, the, the comment here was that in many cases you want to ask the student, why do you want to do that? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, asking this question anytime would eliminate questions that you do want to answer mm -hmm. and would fill them insecure with their uh, questions and would you know, take much more time in class. I mean, I don't want to ask the student a question. I just want to answer him and go on. So uh, I, I do not ask for any question. Why do you want that? It depends. It's also, uh, it's also different, you know, different fora, different, different environments. If you're, sure. if you're doing a class lecture, yeah, you don't want to go down that way. If you're, if you're giving, a, giving a talk here at C++ now, you may want to be like, what are you trying to do here? Yeah. Or, or we, if you are sitting one on one with, yeah. with a student, yeah. it's yeah. another scenario. Yeah. scenario. Okay, uh, what should we teach? The syllabus. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is a discussion in uh, SG20 about, okay, uh, what should be the C++ syllabus? And I would tell you that it is complicated. It is complicated because it depends on what is the background? Where do they come from? What do you want to achieve? How much time do you have, etc. So I would just tell you what I teach I can tell you that. I can't tell more than, uh, much more than that. So I have two C++ courses. The first one in the Academic College of Tel Aviv Yafo. It is for CS undergraduates. It is the first semester on the second year, which is actually the third semester. Um, and they've already uh, gone through uh, two courses using C. The first programming course was intro to programming using C, and the other one was advanced programming, in which they did some data structures. I mean, they 
um, D trees and, and, and lists, um, some open egg systems uh, things, compilation, and things like that. So uh, the course includes the basic of C++, OOP understanding, because this is the first OOP course, and, and it might be that they would not take any other programming course. I mean, J Java, C Sharp, other courses, Python, are non-mandatory. So this is the last mandatory software language course. So they have to get the foundations right. Our value in move semantics, this is an optional bonus part, and this is important. I started with having that as part of the materials. And it was tough, it was tough. And then I um, went another way. There is a chapter in the course, they have the slides, they have the examples, they have the materials. I spent one hour in class explaining temporary objects, our value, move semantics. And then I say, okay, this is bonus. You would have in the exam bonus questions on which you can have additional points. And then they learn it on their own. <laughs> and they do quite well. I mean, it's astonishing. When I teach it, they don't get it quite well. When they get it on their own, they come to the exam and, and, and they actually, I would give you an example of an exercise that I did in class and, and they said, oh yeah, there is something here with move semantics after they just read it on themselves. And, and that's good. So using optional bonus is, is I, it, it's a good thing. I use it also for uh, private and protected inheritance. I don't go through that. I just say, okay, this is what it is. Um, two minutes explanation. Don't ask me questions because it's not in the material. It's a bonus. I might ask about that in the exam. You may get bonus uh, points if you want to read that and go through the example. It's not important enough to invest time in. Uh, same usually is with, with multiple inheritance. And of course with multiple virtual inheritance. Okay, I just skip it. And, and I say, okay, it's an bo uh, optional bonus and they have the examples and they go through it. Uh, templates, Lambda expressions, stood containers and algorithms, including iterators, including being able to implement their own data structures, iterators, so they actually know how it is being implemented. I mean, we try to understand how list is being Im implemented in the standard library, and how algorithm, simple algorithm, uh, like find, find if, count if, etc. In the other course, where it is a non-mandatory, non-compulsory uh, C++ course, um, they already know OOP. It is the third year course, so I use it in order to take them farther and we add also smart pointers, which I do not do in the other course. By the way, I don't teach smart pointers in the mandatory course, but I show them an example of something which is a smart pointer. And then I say, okay, there is something very similar in the language. So eventually they know what smart pointer is, and in some cases I do use it in class exercise. And I say, okay, here a smart pointer who can assist us, so you remember that we talked about that, I would just do something. So we, they see that, but it's not in the material. In this course, the third year, third year course, I do smart pointers and concurrency and multi-threading. So they actually do some complicated stuff. Um, students should be able, at the end, implement complicated projects, like, for example, in both courses, uh, autonomous vacuum cleaner that maps the house and you know go back to the battery etc uh, SIP storage management and algorithm uh, many games I like giving uh, game exercises I would uh, show you one uh, complicated C++ code that they should be able to read like understanding how stood shared, uh, 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 shared PTR works I mean they implement something similar uh, stood any Vector of bulls. I mean, we see, not vector of bulls, but we see something similar, and they say, okay, we understand how you are using bits for holding booleans. And, and it's important to be able to read C++ code. Uh, stop te teaching C. So, I don't teach C. They come with C. Uh, but I do go, in some cases, bottom up, and in some cases, top to bottom. So, so I mix and match. I mean, in some cases, I do go first and they build their own string. So before teaching std string, they build their own string, which is not stop teaching C. We are doing C. We are doing allocations. We are doing RAII. We are doing destructor. 
And then they meet two string and I say, yeah, but there is something already there. But on the other end, uh, they use vector and, and uh, data structures before I teach them templates. So in some cases, it's top to bottom. In some cases, it's bottom up. It depends. Uh, this is um, the end of chapter three. This is what I teach. Any comments? I would make it a bit shorter because I uh, a bit of lack of time. But one or two comments, if you have, or a question. Yes. My comment is just I really like this is my opinion. Probably. I mean the material as you teach the order. I like this kind of comments. The comment was I really like that uh, syllabus or the the way you <laughs> teach that. I don't yeah, have I like it. That's it. Okay, that's that's a good comment. Yeah. Anybody else want to give the same comment? Uh, yeah. Here. I just, I just want to confirm what we should. This is about what we should teach in a course teaching C plus plus. I'm not saying that. Uh, the, the, the question was, this is what we should, and, and I don't think we should. I, I, I'm just presenting here what I do. Okay. So, so sorry. You so can this continue. Is in the context of a course dedicated to teaching the C plus plus language not a course that is teaching another subject that happens to be using C++. That's correct. Okay. So the, the comment was, this course teaches C++ and not another topic like data structures using C++. That's correct. Okay. We have, uh, it is a three hours, both courses. Three hours class and two hours as a class exercise. I did it. It's a five total. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to continue. Sorry. I would keep the questions and at the end, if we have time for comments and questions, because I want to talk about the class lab exercise. So um, I do love co live coding. Uh, maybe, maybe I would do live coding here in C++ now also. So uh, I, I write code with the students in the lab exercise. It, it's not only me, I, I take some of the lab exercises. I have teaching assistant who's taking some others. But eventually I like live coding because in live coding, you end up actual compilation errors and runtime bugs. I mean, they see that the teacher also get compilation errors. And they see that the teacher is reading what the compiler is saying because they don't. <laughs> they just go and fix things because, oh, there was a compilation error, so we need to fix the code. Read what the compiler said. You know, it may help you. So they see that I read, and I read it again, and I'm trying to understand. And while I'm doing that, one of them says, oh, it means that you forgot to you. They are smart. They are, you know, faster than I. Uh, practice the student actually reading compilation errors, going through the web if needed, and debugging. It's good. And, and this is a good opportunity not to bake something. I mean, the, the actual problems that arise are real. They see me struggle. They see me sweat. It's good. They, they, they see it's, it's not hard only for them. So um, this is a recent, a recent example that I, I, that I did, OK? And th there was a bug inside. I must say, quite an embarrassing bug. I would show you the bug. And, and then we discussed the bug. And then we solved it. And we had the opportunity to talk about something which is then the optional bonus part. And it, it was a great experience. So l let me do that. I would grab a chair so I can go to, usually I use an online compiler in class. So I can share the link with them. But in some cases, I use uh, Visual Studio. So let me see if you go. In this case, I was using Replit, which is a very nice environment. OK, so I would not go through the entire thing, but there is a pet base class, uh, which I didn't forget the virtual destructor this time. Good for me. Uh, I show them that you cannot call, I, I mean, you can call a virtual function from a constructor or destructor. Oh, it's, it's too small. Let me try to enlarge that. OK. I think it's better now. OK, so um, we had the pet class. And we discussed that you cannot call a virtual function from the destructor. And then at the end, we want a vector, a polymorphic vector of different kind of pets. So I used, at the beginning, a polymorphic vector of pet star. And then I told them, maybe instead of holding a pet star, we can have a class holding the pet, which we would be used for our AII. We just delete the pet when the vector is dead. So we implemented a pet holder. And in the pet holder, we had a destructor, which deletes the pet. And in the vector, we hold pet holders. Now, there is an embarrassing thing here, which I didn't realize 
when I wrote it in class quite fast. What's wrong here? You hold the pointer, and when you copy it, you yeah, I, I do not block the copy constructor and the assignment operator. I'm, I'm uh, you know, sinning to the rule of three. Uh, you should, and I'm, I'm telling them that if you have a destructor, you have to block the copy and assignment immediately. I didn't do that. And, and I, I found out that this was the problem when we just ran it. Let's, let's run it, you know, quickly, just quickly. So I, I'm running it. It's, it asks, do you want a dog or a cat? Let's start with a dog. Let's call it Roxy. And let's have a cat. Let's call it Mitzi. And we would see a crash live in class. How embarrassing. And, and, and then I say, OK, let's try to understand why did we crash. And then when we analyze that, we just realize that, oh, you're sending something which is a temporary into the vector somewhere here. OK, this becomes a temporary because you create a holder out of that. And eventually, you have to fix it. So we fix it in class. And when we fixed it, we went to this version, uh, which, what is the solution? What we should do? Yeah, implement move. We just implemented move. Now, a move is an um, optional part. But they did, went with me through that. I mean, it, it solved the bug. And, and I also had to discuss things that, again, w were in the chapter, that if you have move, you implicitly delete the other. So yeah, the rule of five. So we did that, and it, it solves the problem live in class. And then I had the chance of saying, you know what? There is something in the language that can do the same for you, which is called unique, unique pointer. pointer. So, you must have no throw so uh, uh, yeah, we sh I should have a no throw. So yeah, I'm doing this uh, uh, scene uh, again and again. So if you go back to the second example, uh, you, yeah, I, I take a, I would take comment, but we may need later on to postpone any additional code reviews. So uh, yeah, this one. Yeah, uh, the temporary was created. Let's add uh, uh, no except very uh, uh, quickly. Yeah, okay. now I'm fine. So when you did pushback. Yeah. You, act, you were actually using this constructor as an implicit constructor. And yes, that's correct. It hid, uh, creating a temporary, so the constructor should be explicit. Yes. And that also shows the problem. That's oh, you say that if I add here explicit, maybe there is also, uh, but yeah, it might be. But then I think that now I have to explicitly create the holder. And I prefer not to do that. I, I mean, just because I'm lazy. Uh, and, but that's also uh, correct. Anyhow. Uh, I had the chance of having a bug, fixing it with the students, talking about smart pointers, and, and implementing a polymorphic hierarchy. And it was all in uh, hour and a half uh, of uh, lab class. So uh, any questions about things that I do in a lab exercise? I mean, they learn C++, and then, then we do things live. In some cases, I give them the link to, OK, this is what we have so far. And now I want you to continue with the next phase and then just get the link to the uh, online compiler. And then they do the, first, the, the next thing. And then we discuss it. Any questions or comments? I'll take one. Yeah, uh, same. Do you use unique pointer or shared pointer? Uh, in this case, I used unique PTR, but it depends. Uh, here, I can say it depends. Yeah. So one of the things that um, I experienced was having students doing exercises in class. And they would then show me, well, I have this, this error. They don't know what that means. And I tried to you know, let them know, well, this is a link error. What does that tell us? Your program compiled, but didn't link. What kind of problem could there be? I would also see other kinds of things where I knew immediately, oh, well, you left const out here, or something like that. But it occurred to me, and I didn't actually do this because I didn't close the loop. but. What I should have done is, because I saw these same errors, they were getting the same errors, I should have incorporated that in the instructions. In other words, I said, you know, in the lecture part, say, suppose we got a message like this. When it's relevant to what I'm talking about, then, you know, what if we didn't have this const, what kind of error message would we get? And I think if I had done that, I would have made them better prepared to do this on their own without having to say, oh, I'm stumped, John, what do I do? So uh, uh, John raises here that in many cases, you can prepare ahead 
things that may go wrong and discuss that so when they um, face this issue, they know how to solve that. And I'm doing that. I mean, I'm discussing what are the reasons for getting a linker error and what does it tell you and uh, what you have to look for, etc. But when you actually, I mean, I take it, uh, it uh, in many cases, you take something that you do and, and you just then give excuse for that. I'm having live coding in class and I, I'm having my own bugs there. And I feel that's good. This is what I'm saying. Somebody can tell you, you should have prepared that ahead in, uh, you know, back home, and then you would not have the bug. And I'm saying, no, I like my bugs. I want to do my bugs with the class. This is what works for me. I, I don't think that was what John was, uh, was suggesting. If he was maybe saying. he thinks it was, but yeah. you can tell. What I, what I heard from John was that he might say, you know, if you get an error like this, these are possible causes. That's uh, okay. That's also important. Yeah. When uh, a student gets something wrong, uh -huh. I'm not telling him the reason. Mm -hmm. I'm asking a question. I mean, let's try to understand. Right. And then he has to, he, she needs to answer mm -hmm. in order for them to find the issue. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, homework exercise. So this is the homework exercise I'm giving this uh, semester. Uh, anybody knows this uh, uh, game? I used to play it when I was a kid. It is called Thunderbird. Uh, it was on a Sinclair Spectrum. I had a Sinclair Spectrum where I was writing basic uh, and playing games like that. It, it is a console game. There are two spaceships here uh, going through a pyramid and they are uh, out of oxygen. They have to go out, but they have to push blocks in order to go through the tunnels. And then they have to implement that game. I mean, I like them to implement things that me and the exercise checker would be happy to test. Because, yeah, we are just playing games. And they do quite a good job. I mean, we enjoy playing their games. So this is not there. This is the actual game. But um, I can show you the specification. Uh, usually, I write the specification in English, even though uh, uh, we are speaking Hebrew there. Uh, uh, because they have to be prepared for the industry, which usually speaks English. Um, I mean, speaks Hebrew, but uh, works in English. Uh, so this, this is a specification for the game that you are seeing here, and it is a long specification with many instructions saying, okay, this is X1, you need to do this and that, etc., etc. And then they have a forum where they can ask questions, and I'm very formal with them. So they learn how to actually program complicated things. Uh, let's go back. So this was the exercise. Uh, they get comments on their code, actual code review comments. I mean, I invest time with exercise checker to give good comments. You forgot, like the teacher forgot, no accept. You forgot, like the teacher forgot, uh, to block your copy constructor and assignment operator, etc. cetera. Uh, we, we reduce points, even alpha point, for very you know, minor things because I learned over the years that if you comment on something without reducing any points, they just ignore that. So even if it is, I have a comment on the name, you should have a better name, minus alpha point. And then they feel, okay, I need to fix it for the next time, otherwise it's just, yeah, the teacher said, but it doesn't really matter. An important note, I always emphasize a working imperfect Exercise is better than a perfect non-working exercise, and that's important. I tell them, don't fix anything on the day of submission. The day of submission is only for a few more testing, asking for a uh, delay, if I can uh, give you, but not for uh, last you know, fix, and then let's submit it with a fix without testing. Don't do that. Um, and, and manage your time and submit something which is working, even if it is not perfect, and when we discuss the exercise in class or in um, the, the teacher uh, meetings, uh, meeting with the teachers, um, I always tell them, okay, this was a good question, a design question. Maybe you can do it better, but you don't have time for that. Don't do that. Do it for the next submission. So managing the time is very important. I mean, maybe I, I just, you know, I saw your code and I'm telling you, yeah, there is a better way of doing that, but do, don't do it. 
postpone it for the next submission. Um, so I would take again a comment on the exercise, maybe if somebody else has any comment. Hans, how yes. do you deal with copying? How do I deal with copying? So um, I change my exercise every semester. So they get another exercise. I, I'm quite imaginary, uh, imaginative. I, I, you know, there are many games. There are many things that you can uh, create. And if, if they copy one from the other, we see that. There is also a, a, a system that checks for, um, for uh, copying, but the, the exercise checker sees that. How do you see that when somebody else, a senior student, writes their homeworks? You mean uh, maybe somebody else wrote their code? I cannot know that. Uh, by the way, there are some meeting repairs. I also cannot know if somebody was working and the other was serving coffee. I, I cannot know that. Uh, but it is their own responsibility. They know that this is the way to learn. I mean, if they would not do their exercise, you know, you can just enroll, get your paper at the end. You would not pass interviews. You have to know how to program. So usually I see that they come and ask questions in pairs. They, I see that they're working, but I cannot observe that they are working at home. So at University of Michigan, depending on the course, most of them use what they call an auto grader, where the student submits their solution, and then it is run through a suite of tests, and the student is given some degree of feedback. Some of them is just, this test failed. Some of them even print the errors or the reason why it failed. How do you, do you use something similar? OK, so the question was, do I use automatic testing, or uh, auto grader? So in some exercises, I do. In others, I do not. Like, for example, in the auto vacuum cleaner, we had some uh, uh, automatic testing, and we provide some of the tests up front so they can test themselves. And then we add some more. In other, like for example, games, it's a manual check. So it depends on the exercise itself. Let's go to the exam. And again, it might be, currently it seems not, but maybe we would have some more time at the end for comments, the exam. It's important because it is something that bothered me for many years. And I think that currently I reached, um, I don't know, the point of uh, Nirvana. I, I, I don't know. I, I think that I have a good exam. Okay? This is what I feel. The students, in a way, agree. The head of the faculty is meeting less students after my exam, which is a good thing. So, at the beginning, I had an exam with two parts writing code and reading code. I, I, it, it was three and a half hours, quite long. Uh, the uh, writing code part was, for example, writing the back end of a Monopoly game writing the back end of a 9 on 9 spreadsheet engine. It doesn't sound too complicated, but during an exam, it is quite complicated. I like these, but they didn't. Uh, during the reading code part, they have to read some kind of a 100 lines code program. There is an example. OK, let's uh, show you an example. The exam is, Ibr is in Hebrew. But the questions are, I mean, the code. The code is in C++. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a base expression. And at the end, let's just you know, go to main. In main, I have here an expression that creates some sum. At the end, by the way, this one dies. And there is II deleting the expression. So there is a math expression that knows how to calculate itself. It's a 74 lines piece of code. And they have to read it and answer multiple questions about the code. Uh, this is one part. Uh, there is another one here, a uh, string with reference counter. OK? So these are examples of things that they have to do in the reading part of the exam. Important notes. They get before the exam six complicated programs, out of which I would give them two in the exam itself. So they actually see the code up front. But not the exact same code. I mean, I change it a bit. And I'm saying that you know that you may get uh, code that have bugs. And I'm saying that for two reasons. Because in some cases, intentionally, I plant a bug. And in some cases, I do it unintentionally. Uh, so uh, they know that the questions might have something that doesn't work correctly in the code, but this is the code. By the way, during the exam, they, am ask they are asking me, uh, in this line, is there something wrong? Because it doesn't work as it should. And my answer during the exam is, 
it does what it do. I mean, this is the code. What do you expect it to do? I mean, this is what it does. It doesn't really, you know, it does not necessarily do what you saw before the exam. The code is changed a bit. And they do not get their questions ahead. And why do I do that? First, to have less students at the head of faculty uh, office after the exam. And second, because the, they learn much better. I mean, they would learn these six examples. They would learn it very good. If I ask them a question on the exact same piece of code, they know it. So it's a good uh, opportunity to let them learn um, reference counted string, uh, smart pointers. I mean, I give them a smart pointer, uh, iterator over a list, and things like that. So I, I believe that the exam is part of the learning experience. It's not just assessing them. It's getting them prepared for the exam is part of the teaching experience, part of the learning. So this is the reading part. In the past, 40% failed. The average was about 70 out of uh, 100. Many complaints. And I did many things to try and, and uh, change that. So I divided the exam into two separate parts. Because in, in some cases, because they got it all together, they didn't know how to manage the time. So I said, OK, there would be two parts separated by an hour break. You come for the whole morning. It didn't help. I mean, it helped a bit for some of them. But it is still hard. I, uh, I did the exam in the um, lab where they can write the code, not in IDE. Why? Because if you do it in IDE, you spend much more time in getting it compiled. I don't want it to be compiled. Don't bother yourself with small syntax issues. Just, you know, maybe it's easier for you to write in a text editor. OK, we tried that. It didn't help. Nothing helped. I mean, writing code in the exam is very tough for some of them. So what I did is I just dropped that. Now they just read code in the exam. They write code during their exercises, I hope. But the exam itself is, is reading code. Why? Because in a way, during uh, you know, a very limited short time, for some of them, it's, you know, it's intimidating, it's squeezing, you, and you cannot expect them to do that. And still, the, you get a good spread of, uh, of, of grades. So much less failures. The average is a bit higher. And I feel well with that. And the students feel well with that. I mean, it's more fair. Uh, and we have the bonus part. So the bonus part is about 20 points that you can get in order to be closer to 100. You cannot pass the 100. So you can get back points that you lost on other questions. And they do work on learning the bonus material, which is good. Yeah, I want you to know move semantics. But I don't expect you to, only if you want. And they want, because there is a bonus part. This is the end of chapter 6 about the exam. Yeah, a comment there. Uh, including the reading part. Okay, but you don't, you don't do the writing part anymore. It's just That's part. correct. I just dropped so, it and, and the, the, the time uh, shrinked a bit. So, it is two so, hours. So it, it became obvious to you that asking students to write code in a short period of time, like, you know, in, in a high pressure environment, was not a good way to assess them. So then why is that how we do 90% of our interviewing? OK, so the question is, if uh, asking <laughs> people to write code, if asking people to write code uh, uh, during a short period of time is not the right way to assess them, at least this is what I'm saying, so why do we interview like that? And my answer here is that it is not the same. Because in this exam, the writing part was not write something short. It was not, you know, I'm sitting near you, you can ask me questions. You are in an environment where if you want to ask a question, maybe you would meet me 20 minutes later, OK? It's not the same environment. It's not the same thing. And uh, I was, um, you know, pointing at something that I want you to write to see the design. It was a bit more than a work interview. And again, it was without the communication part. And in the interview, the communication part, I think, is the important piece. And if you have a, a, a job interview where somebody has to write code in two hours and you do not speak with them during this time, 
I think that you have the same issue. You may uh, eliminate people you sh which maybe you should take. Maybe yeah, a, 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 a commenter. We don't ask any candidates to write code for this very reason. We don't believe it's a, a valuable assessment. We do have them read code uh, in the interview. That's nervous enough for many, many candidates um, uh, who you know, are, are very good. But we don't ask them to write code because we don't believe we need to see them write code. So, so the comment here is that yes, in, in, in some places, the job interview doesn't include writing code for the same reason, maybe. Yeah. Writing code in an interview is not about writing code. It's about can the person do problem solving? How do they approach it? How do they break down the problem? And communication, uh, right. I, would, I would say. Can they ask you follow-up questions on but when you, you gave them an incorrect thing or something that wasn't exact? We, yeah. Yeah. I, I would stop this. I would stop this discussion. It's an important discussion. We would take it offline. Yeah. And the question of, of how do you interview is another topic, which is an important one. And, and I, I also interview occasionally. And in some cases, I do ask write a piece of code, but it is a very short piece of code. And the important part is the communication, not actually okay. I'm going to and in the exam, it's not the same thing. And I would not give two hours for write code in an interview, which I did in the exam. It was too high of expectations, which at the end I just dropped. I would take later comments because I'm on the last chapter and I have enough time for the last chapter and many and maybe uh, a few comments. So conclusions. Uh, most important part when teaching, be the motivation in, in each and every, in every uh, um, lesson. I mean, not only on the first one. Create sense of ability. They have to success. They have to succeed. I mean, I mean the, the, you cannot, like for example, in the exam, I cannot expect 40% failures and say, OK, the course is fine. Um, and I was struggling with that. I mean, I tried to change things. And I, I feel OK with the current formula that I have. But I can still change. I'm you know, learning all the time how to do things better. I try to. Let them enjoy the beauty of C++. By writing nice things, by writing games, by implementing complicated stuff and saying, OK, the algorithm works. Whoa, it's nice. BFS, DFS, things that maybe they learn elsewhere, or I'm giving them. And then I say, OK, you can learn, you can learn about this algorithm. And then I want you to implement that in your uh, exercise. Maybe I give some bonus on a uh, nice algorithm. So they should enjoy. By the way, I'm telling them, if you do not enjoy that, Maybe you are in the wrong occupation. I mean, you should enjoy each and every loop that you're writing. You should enjoy each and every bug that you are analyzing and debugging. Because this is what you're going to do in the next 20, 30, 40 years. It's, it, it is still time to, you know, to reconsider. And then they hear that and they re-persuade themselves that, OK, we, we do enjoy. Yeah, we do enjoy debugging. I actually tell them. You should enjoy it, otherwise, you know, you're in the wrong place. Remember, they are just students. Adapt your expectations. On the other end, don't aim too low. Let them work hard, but help them. I mean, in some cases, I give them something that when they see, they are shocked. And then, in the lab exercise, I solve part of it. So we go to the lab exercise, and then I say, what do you want us to do today? Do you want us to start with your exercise? Maybe you can you know, write the beginning of the exercise, and then we write together the beginning of the exercise, and they have the jump start, and they are very happy about that. And, the, and, and then they say, OK, now we know how to start, because you started it for us. So work with them, but then give them also some complicated things to do. And the similar syntax is, is a tool. I mean, it's important, but it's not the most important part. The most important part is to get them be good software engineers. So you have to uh, be hard on the software engineering practices. I mean, a working exercise is better than good code of non-working exercise. And, and manage your time and work together as a team correctly and do tests. I mean, either manual tests or if you can do automatic tests, etc. 
Any questions before we conclude? We have some time for additional discussion and some additional comments. Yes. your examples were, I'd say, enormous. And they have to understand a lot of the domain. They have to decompose everything into smaller pieces. And that might be a lot more complicated yes. than actually writing code. So the, the question was, for the exam, as you try to give them a smaller uh, implementation problem, smaller problem, something that can be done in the time frame? And the answer, yes, I did. And of course, if, if the question is shorter, my expectations are higher. In which case, I expect them to, you know, to be more uh, strict on the syntax. And, and, and at the end, they didn't do better. I mean, maybe they add it on time. But then if there are you know, embarrassing syntax errors, which I say you should know how to write inheritance, even if, and it is with open material. I mean, you forgot, you know, just go through the material. I, I, and, and again, it was not good enough. And if it is not good enough, I cannot pass you. I mean, maybe I could pass you if I wouldn't see that. But once I saw that, I'm sorry, the person comes and say, maybe we can uh, you know, add some points here and there, and then I can continue. I, I, I would be happy to, but you know, with this exam, I cannot. And, and, and then, if you focus on, you should be reading code well, and during the exercise, you would write code, I feel well with that. But aren't you now? letting students pass who still cannot write syntactically correct code in a short time, but you just don't know? It's a good question. It's a good question. Uh, uh, the question was, so maybe now you pass students who you cannot write good code, and you just don't check that. So, well, I do check that in the exercise, even though they do it in pairs, and maybe someone else is doing their exercise. I don't know. And again, assessment is one of the reasons for doing assessment is for knowing that nobody cheats. But this is not the only reason for that. I mean, if I assess them in the exercise and they do get good comments, I mean, they, get, they are getting code reviews and they are getting comments and they discuss the comments with me later. Why did I lose uh, two points here? Because, oh, I now understand, okay. So I think this gets them for the writing part and, and that's fine with me. Yes. So the question, if I get it right, is that the real world is not always object oriented. Is never. I, I can take it for another talk. We would not, you know, discuss that here. But, but in many cases, I discuss in class the exercise and the different possibilities for implementing things. And by the way, I didn't uh, uh, um, present that, but I'm very liberal with many um, possibilities. I mean, yeah, you can use inheritance. I think it is something that can work for that. Oh, maybe you can use templates if we uh, already went through templates or, or if he knows about that. Oh, um, yeah, I think that virtual functions here would work or maybe you can do without um, allocations. I prefer you not. I prefer that you would avoid allocations, but yeah, you can use them if, if you think it uh, works well for you. So I'm not pushing them for a certain uh, solution, but I, I'm discussing in class the possible solutions. Uh, I would take last comment, and then I have a last slide before we depart. So please bear with me for last comment, last slide, and then I would stay here for additional discussion. So I want to go back to an earlier point for uh, less women and more women to first class. And I think you know we, this is a fairly early stage in the pipeline that eventually leads to, let's say, places like this. 
So the, the question was, uh, was about out outreaching for more women in C++ and, and if it starts in the academia of less women, then this is the funnel, then we would have less women at the end. Uh, so my advice here is if it is mandatory or if you encourage more women, but um, I discussed that uh, with women in the industry and, and I have some ideas, but I cannot tell you that I have a good answer. I mean, encouragement, or making things mandatory, but then, okay, okay, you have to encourage more women into computer science, and then when they are there, to encourage them for C++ uh, or other things that you want them, um, I, I mean, for diversity. But it's an open, open question. I, I really don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I have some thoughts that we can discuss together. Uh, and I, I, again, I would be happy to discuss this with any of you. And this is uh, the last slide before we depart. Uh, Core C++, I'm one of the organizers of the Core C++ in Tel Aviv. In Bal here at the back is uh, one of the other organizers of Core C++. The conference would take place on Tel Aviv, in Tel Aviv on the 5th to the 7th of September. And the call for speakers is open. We uh, do sponsor uh, expected, accepted speakers, travel expenses. So if you travel from abroad, uh, we have some budget that we manage to use in order to bring people from abroad to speak. And of course, come also to be part of the conference, to hear the lectures. Uh, this is the third time. Oh, this is the, the shows from uh, last year, if you ask yourself. Um, so this would be the third course C++ 2022. Come, submit your talks. Thank you very much. I'm here for additional questions. Thanks.